Hello there, people. Uh, I've finished a book. Maximilian and Juarez. No subtitle, which is a little bit unusual for the books that I read. Uh, it's a little bit earlier in the morning here. And I'm trying to do the video on the other side of the pool. But I still can't see the screen. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is. Maybe I'll have to actually have the sun shining in my face. I don't know. This book I purchased down here. My wife found a used bookstore. We have to drive all the way to Punta Gorda to get to it. It's not as big as King Book, but they have a little they have a little uh, section that that appeals to me. And as soon as I saw that book, I just snatched it right off the shelf because uh, the little Maximilian episode in Mexico is one of, the, one of the more bizarre things that have happened. I have read about it before, but I think the other books that I had... Uh, fucking poodle is over here. Uh, the other books that I have read about it before weren't about Maximilian but Maximilian did figure into the story. So I, I think I got a lot more information this time. And my only complaint about this book is that it is so full of information that there's no way I can remember it all. In fact, the author, uh, Jasper Ridley, uh, it's, it's almost like he realized about halfway through the book that Hey, I'm, I'm giving him too much. I better get to Maximilian. Because I'm, I'm more than halfway through the book before Maximilian ever sets foot in Mexico. Uh, I enjoyed the book so much that this is one of those books where it's like bittersweet to even finish it. Uh, I just finished it this morning. I have another book to go to. But I think the other book is going to be really fast too. I think I read this in five days. Uh, so we're going to have to go back to the bookstore. Let's get to my notes. The book was published in 1992. It's 290 pages. Uh, I've got some stuff to read, and I don't know how comfortable I'm going to be reading here because I'm in the deep end of the pool. And I say searching for an emperor here. Third paragraph, page 15. As the years went by and Guterres watched Republican governments succeed one another in Mexico, he became more conservative. The Mexicans just had one revolution after another. He no longer favored a constitutional monarchy on the English model, but preferred government by an autocratic, conservative sovereign, like the monarchs of the Holy Alliance of Russia, Austria, and Prussia. In 1846, he went to Vienna and was received by Metternich, who was everywhere regarding as the leading champion of conservatism and the most hated enemy of the revolutionary Republicans. Guterres appealed to Metternich, Metternich as the great protect, protector of order and religion to save Mexico from anarchy. And yes, that is the Metternich from, uh, from Napoleonic times, uh, he was something of a survivor, a very interesting guy. And many of the revolutions in Mexico, ah, that's what it is. It was, it was order and religion versus freedom. Uh, this, this author is an Englishman, so he writes Habsburg with a B, not Habsburg with a P. I prefer the B. Second paragraph, page 52. Yeah, this paragraph is going to show some of the interrelations between European monarchy. Those inbred motherfuckers. He went on from Paris to the court of King Leopold of the Belgians at Lacken near Brussels where he met Leopold's daughter, Princess Charlotte. And they're talking about Maximilian here. 
They fell in love almost immediately and with a few months were officially engaged. King Leopold, who became Maximilian's father-in-law and exercised great influence over him, was called the Nestor of Europe by journalists because of the shrewd political advice he gave his relatives in the European royal families. He was a younger son to the, of the Duke of Coburg, the tiny German sovereign state that produced brides and bridegrooms for more powerful monarchs. His sister was Queen Victoria's mother, and his brother was the father of Victoria's husband, Prince Albert. Leopold himself, when he was a young man, married Princess Charlotte Augusta, the granddaughter of George III of England, who was second in line of succession to the English throne. But 18 months after the marriage, she died in giving birth to a stillborn daughter. Now, just a little bit. Get out of here! Just a little bit about the, the inner relationships between the European monarchs. Uh, this dog is going gonna, is gonna to knock over the camera is what it's going to do. And that is not Leopold, the Belgian Congo Leopold. That was his son. Uh, when the French troops, when this first, you know, this, this design on Mexico, this fiasco... When it first came about, it was like three countries doing it. Uh, it was Britain, Spain, and Austria. But the British and Spanish troops leave Mexico. And I've got something marked here from page 95 there. I'm, I'm, I'm already thinking I've got way too many. Uh. I don't know how that could be page 95 because there's page 95 ends there. Anyways, <laughs> the, uh, the British and the Spanish decide that it's not a good idea. When they see that the French are going to actually march inland and uh, try to take over the country, they decide to leave. Uh, page 116, and I've got this titled Yellow Fever Vomito. I know what this one is about. They try to get some black troops because the, the Europeans can't stand the, the climate there. Fourth paragraph, one, two, three, four. The French government thought it might look to Egypt for black soldiers. For the Egyptian authorities regularly kidnapped blacks in the Sudan and used them for forced labor in Cairo, Cairo and Alexandria. Egypt was in theory a province of the Turkish Empire, but the office of the Khedive, the Sultan's viceroy, had become hereditary in Mehmet Ali's family, thanks largely to the support France had given Mehmet Ali in the 1830s. Napoleon III now asked the Khedive to show his gratitude for France's support by selling him 1,500 kidnapped black conscripts for service in Mexico. And again, they did this because they couldn't station white Europeans everywhere because they kept they had the unfortunate habit of dying from vomito, whatever vomito is. Uh, I read a book once called The Two Marshals, and, and Bazaine was one of the guys that they, they focused on in that book. Bazaine was a pretty interesting guy, and of course Bazaine was in charge of the French troops for much of the time that they were in Mexico. Uh, they talk briefly about the Crimean War, because most of these guys were in the Crimean War. And of course, uh, you know, Napoleon III kind of, kind of got, you know, he got identified as being this military genius because of the Crimean War. I don't know why. And uh, they talked briefly about the siege of Sevastopol. So, I googled it. Uh, of course, I, I'm vaguely familiar with the Crimean War and the siege of Sevastopol. I'm more, can, I'm more familiar with uh, when the Germans were, were in the Crimea, and they also laid siege to Sevastopol. And it's odd because sometimes they spell it Sevastopol with a B, 
And, and on Google, there was nothing there about the German siege. Uh, it, the German siege went on for a long time, and I just remember these gigantic guns that the Russians had there. And, and the, the Germans actually had to make like direct hits on these guns to knock them out. And I believe they even brought uh, <coughs> these gigantic railway guns that they had. Uh, in 1865, Maximilian does this thing called the Black Decree, where, where uh, any time his troops catch the people that they called the rebels, uh, they were the liberals, they could execute them out of hand. And uh, it was a pretty brutal war between the French and, and the Mexican rebels, Juarez, and, uh, of course, there was Mexican troops that fought with the French. There was actually Austrian troops. There was American volunteers on both sides. But these people would execute each other just out of hand. It was a, it was a pretty brutal war. So this Black Decree, it was just one of the things that uh, made more and more of the Mexican people hate Maximilian. Uh, towards the end of this thing, there's... I have Austrian slash French slash Mexican warship on the Rio Grande that actually fires on American troops. Uh, part of the big, uh, you know, the European reaction to this, whether the Europeans supported Maximilian or did not support Maximilian, uh, the United States' attitude to all this was was what made up their minds. None of them wanted to go to war with the United States uh, because the United States was, was powerful uh, and because it's pretty difficult to wage a war when you have to cross the ocean. And the European monarchies, their opinions all changed after the American Civil War was over. This was all going on while the Civil War was going on. There was a, also, I didn't mark this, but uh, there was also an incident where some black troops crossed the Rio Grande, took over a town for a couple of days, and looted and raped. And, and, and uh, so, so there actually was gunfire between Mexico and the United States. I don't know if this would have been 1865 or 1866. Okay, so I have June... 19th, 1967 written down. That's when it all ends badly for Maximilian. He's taken prisoner and he's he's executed. He's, he's shot by a firing squad. So one of the things that, that struck me about this is the Prussian ministers that are in Mexico plead for leniency. They, they, want, they want them to not execute Maximilian. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, isn't, uh, isn't Prussia at war with Austria at this time? No. The Prussian-Austrian War is already over. That, that began in July 1866. And it's just kind of, I'm thinking while I'm reading the book, why haven't they mentioned this? And then, of course, they do mention it in the very next paragraph. It, it, they only give it a couple of sentences. Uh, it helps me to have that historical perspective. Okay, bottom of 276 to top of 277. I gotta wrap this up because this is going on way too fucking long. 276. The, ex the execution took place early in the morning of June 19th on the outskirts of Queretaro on the, on the Serra de la Campanas. Sorry about my pronunciations. The hill where Maximilian had surrendered on May 15th. Maximilian awoke before daybreak and prayed by candlelight at a little altar that he had been that had been erected in his cell. He put on a black frock coat and carried his white hat. Just before 6 a.m., he was taken to the hill, traveling in a carriage with his priest, his valet, Grill, and his Hungarian cook, Todos, neither of whom were under arrest, followed in a second carriage just behind him. They were his only close acquaintances who attended the execution. For Dr. Bash could not bear to go. 
but Magnus was present, and his report to Bismarck is the only one of the many conflicting accounts of the ex execution that was written by an eyewitness. Uh, a young officer was in command of the firing squad, and the six soldiers in the squad were even younger. The officer gave the order to fire, six bullets hit Maximilian, and three of them inflicted fatal wounds. He died instantly, as did Miramon and Mahia. It was all over by 6.40 a.m. The corpse is eventually returned to Austria. Uh, fifth paragraph, page 277. That is the dog. Oh, and I just read that. And just the French troops leaving and things going badly. It put me in mind, I have Afghanistan and Vietnam written down there. It put me in mind of, of what's happening right now in Afghanistan when the American troops and everybody else is leaving. And it obviously put me in mind of, of the American tr troops uh, evacuating Vietnam. And I, I'm not trying to pick on America or nothing. I'm sure that this was done by many other nations throughout history. But uh, again, if, if you ever see this book, get it. It's, it's, it's a little known part of history that to me is quite bizarre. Maximilian was, was uh, a tragic character. His wife Charlotte was even more tragic. I forgot to mention her. I forgot completely. Uh, he does put her on a boat for Europe before things go totally bad and uh, she she goes quite mad and she never leaves an asylum for the rest of her life she lives a long time she lives till she's 87 thanks for watching